All right, welcome back everybody to the Lifestyle Entrepreneur Summit on this sunny Saturday morning in California. I have a very special guest joining us from halfway around the world. Today I am excited to feature Jasper Rivers, aka the Traveling Dutchman. Jasper, welcome to Lifestyle Entrepreneur Summit. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. So are you over in, uh, where are you right now, Jasper? I'm actually at home uh, back in Amsterdam now, which uh, doesn't happen very often as I'm on the road uh, about 10 months out of 12. But uh, yeah, I'm back home in Amsterdam. Well, th that'll make sense to all the viewers more in just a second here. A little background on Jasper and, uh, and the context here is he's actually one of the entrepreneurs that I've featured in the forthcoming U.S. edition of Lifestyle Entrepreneur. And for the last couple of years, he's been traveling to 50-plus countries all around the world with his blog, thetravelingdutchman.com, and most recently um, ha is the author of a forthcoming book called Get Paid for Your Pad, which is all about how he's taken the apartment, which we see him in now in Amsterdam, and put it on Airbnb, uh, rented it out, and figured out how to crack the code to get increasingly more revenue for his apartment that's literally funded global travels for months and months, if not years on end. So I think we've got a very exciting discussion in store here, and uh, we can peel back the layers on how you can get paid for your pad and have it support a lifestyle of travel and freedom and opportunity in true lifestyle entrepreneur fashion. So with that introduction, Jasper, why don't you uh, give us a little background on, on what you've been up to for the last few months, last year. Give everybody a snapshot of what your life is currently like, and then we can dial back the clock and start to investigate where you started out at and, and how you got to the place that you're at now. Yeah, for, first of all, I, I just remembered the, the first time you sent me a copy of your book, and I read the uh, introduction where you described how you were bouncing around in Asia you know, partying in Bali with some new made friends, and, and the next few days uh, you'd be in Hong Kong, in the ICC, uh, discussing some potential business opportunities. And uh, I just remembered how I thought, wow, you know, that guy is doing the exact same thing as I'm doing. So I need to, I need to get to know him. I remember <laughs> that was actually one of our first. Uh, that might have been the first time we met in person in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. That the everything from the prologue of your book sounds familiar, and I thought, exactly. oh wow. Well, I, I just happened to be got a lot in common with this places. guy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I actually just came back from a five-month journey. I started off in uh, one of my favorite countries in the world, uh, Brazil, and um, there was a few reasons why I went there. First of all, I, I recently started a uh, trading firm with my business partner. So we rented a car and we drove through the countryside visiting some of the world's largest coffee producing farms. So that was a, a bit of an adventure. We, uh, we had a flat tire and uh, the, uh, the spare tire uh, turned out to be flat as well. So uh, we were eventually rescued by the mayor of a nearby city who also ended up repairing our car for free. So that was, uh, that was an, a bit of an adventure. Um, but I also spent uh, a week on the beach uh, during New Year's partying uh, with uh, a, a bunch of Brazilian friends and celebrating uh, the end of uh, another great year. So, uh, you know, it was a productive time. Um, also had a lot of fun. And after that, I went to Medellin in Colombia. And there I shared an apartment with some fellow lifestyle entrepreneurs, in fact. And um, I always like to meet up with other entrepreneurs on the road because it's always good to you know, exchange ideas and experiences and learn from each other. So that was a, uh, a really good experience. And then I finished it off with a week in Curaçao which is a very small island in the Caribbean. It's actually uh, a Dutch island. It's one of the remains 
of our once very powerful kingdom of the Netherlands, <laughs> <laughs> just to get a little bit of national pride in the interview. Um, but it's also a, uh, a really nice tropical island where I swim with uh, turtles. I saw flamingos, and uh, I had a lot of fun uh, meeting up with an old university friend who now uh, lives there. So all in all, it was a, uh, a, pretty, uh, a pretty good tour. So you could say, so literally, for the last, just to reiterate this point, for the last five months, you've been traveling throughout South America, Central America, the tropics, and beyond without, uh, without interruption or without going back and forth between your place and Amsterdam. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And I had my place rented out almost 100% of the time on Airbnb. So I, want to, I would definitely want to dive in and, and talk about how you've set up everything on, on Airbnb so that your apartment is actually funding these trips, uh, or at least in large part. But uh, I wanted to sort of paint a picture more of, because for the last couple of years, or at least since we met, you know, you also started uh, the TravelingDutchman.com, the blog, and I talk mm -hmm. about uh, that in, in Lifestyle Entrepreneur. And uh, so really you've had, in addition to doing just traveling and having fun, meeting other entrepreneurs and, and having these adventures, you're documenting them and also sharing stories and, and strategies for how other people can achieve this lifestyle but also uh, explore some interesting places in the world. Do you have some standout memories from the last couple of years of traveling to you know 50 plus countries that you want to talk about and share to really paint a picture of this lifestyle? Wow, that's a difficult question. You know, there's so many highlights. Um, you know, the last four years have, have been such an amazing adventure for me. Um, going to all these, you know, different countries. Uh, I, th I think some of the highlights were definitely, uh, uh, I've done a lot of scuba diving in places like the Bahamas and Thailand, um, Philippines, Indonesia. Um, one of the cool adventures also was I went lobster hunting in the Bahamas where we literally grabbed the spare, dived in the water, caught a bunch of lobsters and grilled them right on the beach. <laughs> uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty fun. Um, as well as uh, lots of other things. God, I can't even, uh, I can't even remember all the all the fun stuff that uh, I've been doing, but uh, you know it includes skydiving in Hungary. Uh, I went rafting in Brazil. Um, Didn't you go to Vanuatu or the volcano island nation somewhere in the South Pacific? Yeah, that was that was actually one of my favorite trips too. Uh, um, I was in Australia and I realized I was fairly close to some of those islands that are usually just so far away that it's not even realistic to even go there, you know? Uh, so I went to Fiji, which was an amazing experience, and uh, Vanuatu is probably a little bit less well-known, but there's a, uh, an incredible wreck right in front of the coast that was a former uh, uh, troop a transport ship uh, from the U.S. They were trying to transport some troops in the Second World War when it hit a mine. And uh, 5,000 people uh, were on the boat, and they all, they all got, they got off safely. But the, the wreck is just right off the coast, so it's a pretty amazing dive if you were into uh, wreck diving. I remember I saw some of the pictures from that, and I'd never seen anything quite like it. It was like an entire ship that you could dive and swim through. And yeah, yeah it's pretty amazing. And you know, it I'm was really fun uh, picking up some old guns and, and some old military equipment and taking some pictures in the water and that. Uh, and I, I know most recently there is that uh, picture of you in this like James Bond looking underwater <laughs> scooter contraption. What was that thing all about? I think it's on the uh, the welcome page for Lifestyle Entrepreneur Summit. A picture of you about yeah. to go in the water in that thing. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a fun experience. I, I'd never seen this thing before. Um, this was in Curaçao just uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it's called Aquafari. And you're basically driving around uh, underneath the water on a submersible, self-propelled 
underwater scooter. I don't, I don't even know what the official name of the thing is. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was super fun uh, to do this uh, with, a, with a couple friends and, you know, create, take some videos and some pictures and stuff. Um, so, you know, I think people are listening to this and it, some of the stories and the adventures you have are almost border on, uh, on unbelievable. It's, it's like a dream lifestyle. Um, is it is this something that's out of reach for people to do financially? Assuming that you have control of your own time and you don't have uh, you know a boss and you're able to to take off and travel, are these trips that you're taking just like over the top expensive? Or are you finding that uh, that you're quite able to travel sort of on a on a modest budget? Is yeah, this something I accessible for people to do. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a misconception uh, that travel has to be expensive. You know, um, I think these days there's a, a lot of ways to uh, to travel on a budget. You know, you have uh, you have sites like Couchsurfing, uh, where you can literally crash somebody's couch for free. Um, there's a uh, there's Airbnb that has often very affordable uh, rooms and apartments, and there's also things like house sitting. And house carers, where you you can um, look after somebody's house while that person is on holiday. So there's there's definitely uh, ways to uh, to travel on a budget. Do you have a, a favorite, or do you work with uh, all three? I know that you uh, you rent out your place on Airbnb, but did you ever try couch surfing or the house carers service to give a, a first hand account? No, I actually haven't uh, used those services, but what I often do is stay with friends, you know, because uh, after traveling for, uh, for quite a while, uh, I, I've made a lot of friends all over the world, so, you know, I often, I often stay with them. You know, this is one of the, uh, I, and I agree, I, I enjoy doing that too as much as possible. For people just starting out, this is one of the huge benefits of becoming more worldly and traveling more frequently is you start to build up not only stories and great memories, but a network of people. And if they're also travelers, um, then you find yourself running into them in the most far-flung corners of the globe. And it actually adds uh, a lot more excitement to the experience than just, say, going to all these places by yourself or with a friend uh, traveling right. together because it, it adds this, like, uh, global network dynamic to the whole experience, which I certainly enjoy, and I know it's something that you're living out fully every day. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you uh, on that one. And also, um, I wanted to mention that staying with local people really adds to the experience of traveling as well. You know, being a tourist somewhere versus staying with somebody that knows the places and uh, the, the also the places that are a little bit harder to find that you can't, you know, you won't see on, on, on TripAdvisor or on the Lonely Planet, so to speak. You know, that really adds to the experience as well. So I actually prefer to stay with a, a local person versus, uh, versus a hotel. Yeah, I, I think that that definitely gives you access to more of the uh, the local flavor and culture. I think it makes for a more memorable experience too. Although you know when we uh, doing business with uh, with credit cards and having points and stuff, it's nice to check into a nice hotel every once in a while and get cleaned up and have some some private time. Nice but uh, so you know. It wasn't always like this, though, was it? I'd, I'd love to hear how you transitioned out of your former uh, employment, your former role, and what really sparked this, uh, this transition into being almost a full-time traveler. What was, what was yeah, it like so before? Yeah, at what point did that change occur where you're like, look, you know, I've had enough of, of doing things this way, and I want to try and explore a new, uh, a new lifestyle? Yeah, so I used to uh, work for a trading firm, uh, basically sitting in an office with uh, about eight flat screens in front of me, looking at a bunch of numbers all day and uh, making trades with uh, a click on my mouse, my mouse button. So it's you know it's not the most imaginative uh, environment uh, to be in, and uh, you know even though I I like the trading. Uh, at some point, I've, after about 
five or six years, I started realizing that, you know, making a career and um, and and making money and being successful in that sense wasn't really what I was looking for. You know, it wasn't really um, <clears throat> giving me the fulfillment and the, the happiness that I anticipated from it. You know, when I was young, I I figured that getting a job and making a lot of money was what we're supposed to do, you know, that was the definition of success. So I had a bit of a cold shower, so to speak, at, at that uh, time when I realized, oh, you know, so this is this is not it. There's something else that I that I want to do. And I found yeah, out I that, that would you say that that growing up you sort of it, it, you sort of fell into this role and it was something that was either culturally enforced or it just seemed like the next logical sequence of events that that brought you to a job where you were having you know moderate fulfillment at best. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I I definitely didn't grow up in a uh, environment uh, that uh, uh, that encouraged entre entrepreneurship very much. Um, my my parents, uh, my my dad was a notary. My mom was a teacher, and you know it's not like they were against the idea of of being an entrepreneur. I don't think, but they just naturally encouraged uh, sort of the standard route to go to university and and find a job. And I mean, to me, that also seemed like the most sensible option, given that I had no idea what else to do. Mm. You know, I I remember having thoughts about being an entrepreneur and you know the freedom that comes with it has always appealed to me but I always thought if you want to be an entrepreneur you either have to come up with a with an idea that, that's not around you know like inventing the new Facebook for so to speak or or maybe taking over uh, a business that's run in your family and you know the idea that you could just start a business yourself and and get the freedom to uh, to decide where you want to be and and who you want to be with at any point in time that never really occurred to me and I I just had no idea how to do that so in that sense um, I I kind of just followed the the path that wa was laid out for me with uh, because I didn't know uh, any al better alternative options so so what was the spark or what was the catalyst when you're when you started to change your thinking and realized that you wanted to either start a business or have more lifestyle freedom and the ability to travel, and what was the what was sort of your first adventure in in entrepreneurship? And love to hear how that turned out, what the thought process was, and and what your sort of takeaway was from your first experience as an entrepreneur. Well, the first thing that I did, <clears throat> other than my job. Uh, I had a few friends who started some poker community websites, and uh, I decided to uh, to join them. And this was uh, back in 2005, I think, when the poker was really becoming a big hype. You know, everyone seemed to be jumping on the poker train. Uh, you know, there was uh, tons of advertising on television for online poker rooms, and uh, the poker rooms were paying uh, pretty hefty referral fees back in the day so you know we were uh, we were making a reasonable reasonable amount of, uh, of money by by running these community websites but uh, I uh, you know I have to say to be honest I think that anyone who would have gotten involved in the online poker business would have made money at that point in time because it was you know it was just such a hype but I definitely learned uh, uh, a number of, of, of lessons um, and uh, the the sites are still live but it, it has kind of died down a little bit over recent years. So would you say then that uh, if, if anybody that jumped into online poker at that point had a good chance of making money, do you think your first experience in entrepreneurship and online business was sort of like beginner's luck or uh, did it go well overall? I like to get a sense from everybody on the summit here on on how their first go at starting a business or becoming an entrepreneur worked out, and the the responses range from complete and utter failure to unexpected <laughs> success. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think there was definitely a little bit of luck involved, you know, uh, because the poker train was just uh, going very fast, so to speak, at that uh, point in time. But uh, it, uh, no, it, it was successful at first, but it really uh, kind of died down over the years. Uh, um, so it's, it's not something that, uh, that I rely on so much anymore. Right, and so w at that point, when you were doing the poker, were you still in your trading job in the in the corporate space, or yeah, yeah, you know, all, me and my friends, we all had full time jobs. This was just, just something that we did on the side. And so, so what really uh, catalyzed you making the leap and leaving your job and starting to pursue the the lifestyle that you're enjoying now? And what was the what was the business aspect of that? So what was the what was the decision like? Uh, what finally tipped the scales, and then how did you start to restructure and think about business and generating an income to support that new lifestyle? Yeah. So the main my main motivation from going down this path was the fear of growing old and never have tried to. Sort of reach the the lifestyle that I that I envisioned, you know. I I remember just sitting in my office and dreaming about, you know, just being able to fly wherever I wanted to fly and explore all these all these countries, cultures, learning languages and stuff. And um, you know, I I knew that that's really what I wanted to do, but it it was a little bit tough for me to just give everything up because I wasn't a pretty comfortable situation with my finance job and uh, <clears throat> if I would have stayed I, you know I probably would have been able to retire by the age of 40 or 45 so um, you know just uh, just quitting that and, uh, and and you know taking your backpack and start traveling was was really uh, a tough call for me but it I, you know I was just thinking if I'm not doing it now, then it's never going to happen, and I don't want to grow old without taking that one shot, you know. So that was really the main motivation for me to take this decision. A uh, a, a flash moment where your boss yelled at you or something, and you stormed out and said, <laughs> "Screw this!" It was more of uh, taking into account the overall trajectory of of your life and deciding not to delay the enjoyment and travel opportunities that are available. Is that more accurate? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I was, I was 32 at, at the time, and, you know, I had a girlfriend, I had a nice apartment, a nice car, so I, I was pretty set up to, to sort of settle down and, you know, um, so I, I had a, I definitely had a bit of a sense of urgency, you know, like a sort of, if you want to do this, then you have to do it now. You know, mm -hmm. if, it, if I'm going to wait a few more years, you know, my situation might uh, might might change in a way that it will be much harder to uh, to do it. You know, so yeah, I just uh, it, it just became uh, a, a, like a huge priority for me. You know, just yeah. to to get to try. Totally. So so once you made the choice, because I know a lot of people and a lot of the questions that uh, that I'll get are people right at that point where they want to leave their job or they want to. Uh, go in full steam with a business, and after you made that decision, did things start to fall into place right away, or, or was there like a, a whitewater transition period where you know you questioned the decision you made, or wondering if you were doing something just totally crazy, or was it immediate uh, enjoyment and 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 complete joy after making that decision to leave? Well. You know, it was a joy in the sense that I finally had the freedom and the and the the resources to to uh, to travel, but it uh, it was definitely in the business sense. It was definitely a very long struggle with a lot of ups and downs. Um, first of all, I didn't really know what I was going to do. I didn't know how long I was going to do it for. You know, in the back of my head, I still thought, well, you know, maybe if if I can't find anything that I can do then you know maybe I'll just get a job in, in a year from now or something you know and I remember just sitting on the beach in Brazil and literally googling 
how to make money online. Because even though I was involved with the poker sites, the only thing that I did was was making poker videos and, and posting on the forums. I had no idea how to even build a website or anything. You know, I was a complete. Uh, <clears throat> I, I yeah, I did, I had no knowledge about uh, about the technical stuff or whatsoever. So I uh, I started off but with some really. Stupid ideas that I picked up from some, you know, make money quick website, which, uh, you know, not surprisingly. Let uh, me guess, you didn't make much money and it didn't come quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it, uh, it was a mixed, mixed results, so to speak. But um, I, there was one thing that uh, that actually made uh, made money, where I was just putting Google ads on one-page websites that I optimized for for keywords that had high traffic. And uh, a bunch of these sites were in Brazil, and they were in Portuguese, and I didn't even, <laughs> didn't even know what it was, you know? I just saw in the Google keyword tool that, it, that 2 million people looked for, searched for the term, so I just put up a website, you know, with the URL being the same as that term, and I just put some random Portuguese Excellent with some Google ads. But, That's uh, interesting. Google, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know about that approach. Um, well, but, but I think the strategy is good to find, you know, like a high trafficked uh, term or area, and maybe even putting a real business on it. That's certainly something that I, I do talk about in in lifestyle entrepreneur. But I think in maybe yeah. in certain countries or in different uh, different places where search engine competitiveness hasn't caught up or is in a different state. There's still some opportunities like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, finding some good keywords is, is not bad. But uh, you know, my my websites were were so bad they weren't adding like, any value at all. So Google wasn't uh, extremely happy with my business. So they actually shut it down by uh, by blocking my uh, Google ad account. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that was back to square one. <laughs> Oh man! So at that time, uh, when did you start really getting into putting your uh, your apartment on on Airbnb and and focusing on that? Was this uh, did you do that right away when you started traveling, or did you sort of incrementally uh, start to use Airbnb more? Uh, and I'd love to hear. I'd love to start talking about how you've set up your apartment and and having sort of a ecosystem of services around it or people that support. So that you don't even need to be there, and that your apartment's making you money and, and funding many of these travels. Yeah. So um, you know, I uh, the last year that I was trading, I was I was living in the U.S. in Chicago, so I already rented out my house to long-term rent renters, and that's what I did the first couple of years uh, when I uh, after I started traveling. But there were two problems. First of all, I didn't like the fact that I couldn't, I could never be in my own house. Uh, even when I was in Amsterdam, you know, somebody was was renting my place. The second thing I didn't like was I was, I just wasn't really making a good return on my house, you know. So when I uh, when I heard of Airbnb, I decided to uh, to give it a shot, and well, that was a uh, a really good decision. Because within a few months, my my income almost doubled. So switching um, over to uh, just from switching the site that you had it listed on. Yeah, I mean, from going from long term rental to short term rental on Airbnb immediately increased my return uh, by almost a factor two. And uh, so you know, I I was I was pretty shocked by that, you know. Uh, I just realized, wow, this is amazing! Like you can you can put your house on a on a website, rent it out to tourists, provide them with the opportunity to you know explore your city and your neighborhood without having to stay in a hotel, and also making a really good return on it at the same time. You know, it seemed like a, a huge win win situation. So uh, I got very uh, motivated to. Uh, to sort of uh, improve my Airbnb hosting, uh, 
and uh, also my, my earnings by, by increasing guest experience, making adjustments to my house, and kind of figuring out like how to really win the Airbnb game. So um, that uh, so my house at that point turned into, you know, almost a, pretty much a full time income. So I, I wasn't relying. I didn't need to rely on uh, on the, my businesses so much. And I, in fact, I actually sold uh, a business that I had a, uh, a web shop in uh, nutritional supplements. I actually sold it and uh, focused more on just improving my uh, my Airbnb business. Hey, listening in case Airbnb or this doesn't sound familiar, you're you're probably all familiar with renting out you know an apartment that you own or a house you own for long-term rental to other guests. But what's happened recently with Airbnb.com and a few other sites allows you to have your house, your apartment, any property you own function almost as a hotel. And uh, and there's a large, active, and growing community of people that choose to stay in other people's houses and homes to get that same personal touch and cultural experience that uh, Jasper and I and many people we know enjoy when we travel. And so it's become this second option instead of doing hotels and chains um, or extended stay to be able to actually stay in other people's homes. And that's that's what Jasper is here talking about. So what were some of the things that, uh, that you found after that initial almost 2x increase in revenue that helped uh, people find your place easier or get good reviews and, and raise the awareness so that you kept you know improving the uh, the income that it generated but also the experience for people that came to stay in your place yeah so um, it's it's funny you know because when I when I talk to people about uh, about Airbnb and about the, the book that I write that I wrote <clears throat> A lot of people ask me, well, you know, renting out your house can't be that difficult, you know? I mean, how many pages is the book like? Is it like five pages or something? Because, you, you know, there's a, you do, it's hard to, to see it this if, if, you're not, uh, if you're not doing it, but there's so many factors involved in, uh, in, in getting the, the most out of your Airbnb listing. And I would say the most important thing is to constantly try to improve a guest's experience. Because um, in the end, guest experience is all what it is all about. And this doesn't start when the, when the people enter your house. You know, this starts the moment that you accept a booking. Now, to, uh, to give you a, a good example, I, I had a friend over uh, a few days back, and uh, he was going to London and he told me he thought about booking a Airbnb apartment, but he ended up booking a hotel room. So I asked him, why didn't you go for the Airbnb option? And his answer was, well, I was just thinking, if I go to a hotel, then I'm 100% I'm sure that there's going to be someone to welcome me. You know, there's going to be reception. I know that I, I will have my room. You know, I, I just know that everything will be set. Everything will be set up for me when I arrive. And I was thinking, if I'm just going to stay at somebody's house, I have no idea what I'm getting into. Like, is that person going to be there to even open the door? You know. So that's uh, and I think that's a worry that a lot of a lot of people have. If you if you travel all around the world to stay in somebody's place, you want to feel comfortable and certain that this person this person is going to look after you so if you just took like a long flight or if you've been in a plane for 10 hours last thing you want to think about is showing up at a place and there's just a locked door right so it sounded like people's hesitation to use it was based on uncertainty of of the experience and uh, did you start to address that like specifically in your listing and in how you were marketing your place to make people feel more comfortable and welcomed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, once I, I realized this, you know, it, it really changed the way I communicated with my guests before they arrive. And what I found is that re, um, achieving a high level of guest experience is, is done 
maybe for 50% before the guests arrive because you know if you send your guests an email the moment they book with information about your house, about the neighborhood, about the city, with directions, and you send them a nice welcome email that you and you know you tell them that you're looking forward to hosting them and you tell them exactly who is going to be at your house to welcome them and you give them options to communicate with you you know your guest is immediately going to feel that he's looked after you know so um, so i think communicating with your guest is uh, ex ex extremely important and uh, that's that's already half the battle won if you uh, if you do that uh, if you do that the right way. Did you notice um, a, a big shift or a difference once you started communicating more actively or changing the, the wording on your listing to make sure people knew that they were going to be greeted and that the process was going to be smooth? Absolutely. And you know, it, it actually uh, became uh, obvious to me in a very unexpected way because I noticed that after I started communicating and treating my guests this way, I was never getting any feedback anymore. I was never getting any complaints. And uh, I realized this when I when one day I got an email from a guest who had just arrived at my apartment and who told me that he thought it was completely unacceptable. And, um, you know, I already hosted over 50 groups who all were happy at that time. So I was, I was just furious, you know. I was just so shocked. Um, the person just immediately left my apartment and I just wanted to fly back to Amsterdam and punch this person in the face, you know. <laughs> I was so mad. But then uh, then I realized, you know, a guest is a guest, and if, if, if this person uh, isn't happy, then I, I don't want to, uh, to, to, uh, to make him pay. So I ended up settling with him and paying his money back. And, <clears throat> you know, then I, I had another good look at his complaints. And this, these were all minor things, you know. But still... I realized, well, you know, he actually does have a point. You know, there, there was a few minor things that I... I what was he see. specifically uh, angry about or, or not satisfied with? Well, he was... He just had some minor things, like I had a, a few wires that weren't, like, covered up, like, properly. You know, there were there, there was a few uh, places in my apartment that could have done with a, a bit better lighting. Um, and... Uh, you know, he uh, he complained about not being there was weren't enough places for him to hang his towel. You know, it were pretty minor things, but but what's uh, what's interesting is that once I I started sort of taking a different mind, you know, switching my mindset from being offended to actually thinking, wow, maybe I can actually, you know, I can do something with this feedback to improve my house. So I actually took his recommendations very serious and made improvements to the house. And you know, looking back, I'm actually thankful because you know, because of him, I I I, I managed to uh, to increase my guest experience. But the real point I'm I'm trying to make here is that I also realized that the other guests had never complained about this because they didn't want to complain to me because I was they could tell that I was you know being very proactive in trying to make sure that that they had the best experience possible you know if you are being received well by a host you're not you know you're not very uh, <clears throat> you're not going to complain about something minor you know because you feel like well this guy is doing the best he can you know I'm not going to I'm not going to whine about these little things, and that's when I realized the importance of uh, you know of of communicating with your guests well, and also the importance of being really proactive uh, in asking guests feedback afterwards. You really have to pull it out from from people, you know. Yeah, because for every one person, well, that was an extreme case. It sounds like to just leave, but. 
you got to imagine, and it's been my experience too, that for every one customer that speaks up and and tells you that they weren't happy or something wasn't right, it's actually a blessing because there's probably 10, 20 or more other people that thought it but didn't act on it and resultingly had a not the best experience of your brand or your house or your business. So when somebody does speak up, I think it's great how you took that to be the catalyst to make even more improvements. Did the did the feedback and uh, an experience that you were getting, or the, the feedback you were getting after having changed some of those things, and maybe you can share what they were, start to really improve your? Because uh, I know on Airbnb there's you know rankings just like on a search engine for uh, which location is best, which house, which option is best. So did the feedback and the improvements you made start making your place more visible overall? to people that were looking to get a place in Amsterdam? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, getting positive reviews is one of the key aspects uh, in improving your uh, your visibility, the visibility of your listing in the, in the search results. You know, you, you have to imagine that Airbnb is also, well, the search engine that they use is kind of a little Google, you know, it's kind of a little, little mini Google. So, you know, as with Google, there are all sorts of factors uh, involved in the determining uh, the the ranking, and we all know that it's really important to be on the first page in Google. And this is uh, the same with with Airbnb. You know, if you're on the first page of your city, then you're obviously going to get a lot more bookings than if you're somewhere on page number ten. So, uh, yeah. Uh, getting all these uh, all these positive reviews has definitely uh, contributed uh, to a large large extent to my house now being on page number one for the whole of Amsterdam. And uh, and so what you know for if, for people that are listening to this or people that may have tried Airbnb once or twice um, and then just never did too much more with it, what would you recommend uh, that people do to start? optimizing their listing uh, and or being better better host to start to get some of the you know success and visibility uh, and increased income that you've been able to experience well first of all if you are starting out as an Airbnb host uh, the first thing you need to do is get as many bookings as possible you know this is absolutely crucial to your long-term uh, success. So, even if you uh, have to set the prices at a very low level, and you might you might feel like you know you're you're giving away your place for really uh, for too little money, it's still worth to do that because every booking will generate you a certain amount of money in the future because uh, you know uh, there's mouth to mouth advertising. People can come back, and people will write a review. And these reviews, especially in the beginning, are extremely important. Because imagine looking at a listing that has zero reviews, and comparing that with a listing that has, you know, maybe two or three positive reviews. Now that's a huge difference. You know, just those couple of reviews. So it's really important to get those first few reviews in. Would you liken the experience to, people can probably find an analogy on if you go on Amazon or eBay or if you use sites like Elance or Alibaba, isn't it the difference between seeing somebody that has no work history, no experience, no reviews, no stars versus somebody that's got, you know, 50 uh, reviews and an overall, you know, 4.9 stars, right away before it, all other things are the same, you're going to trust that person much more. and so. I think what I hear you recommending is for people to get on the map and start showing that they've actively gotten their place out there, even if they're taking a little bit lower at the front end in order to get established and then start building up to uh, to a premium. Yes, absolutely. I think that's uh, that's the, the most important thing when you start out, you know. And then there's a uh, then there's a few other things that are that are really important, you know. If you think about Put yourself in Airbnb's position and and think about 
who, which listings would you show on the first page if you were to run Airbnb? And, you know, it's like, it's like logical things, like responding quickly to inquiries, updating your calendar often, you know, updating your description. Just you're basically you're showing that you're actively involved in uh, managing your listing, and that you're uh, <clears throat> you know you're you're working on, uh, on on getting a a good guest experience. And these you know there's also factors that are shown on your listing, like the average response time, for example, is uh, is shown on your listing. So you know I sometimes see listings uh, that has an that have an average response time of over a day. You know, so I don't want to make an inquiry for a place if somebody might not respond to me, you know, within within a within a day even. So those are also really important uh, factors. That's interesting. That's a that's a metric that you don't see on other sites like in Amazon or eBay or Elance. It's, mm -hmm. it's cool that they track that. Um, did you have a strategy, or did you hire somebody to sort of monitor your listing so that you could reply as quick as possible when inquiries are made, or were you doing that yourself? I was actually doing that myself, but you know, Airbnb has a iPhone app uh, that I use, and uh, what I did was I would just almost always make sure that I was online with my. Uh, with my uh, with my iPhone at least, and Airbnb also has a notification system where they send you an email and a text message to your phone whenever there is a booking. So even if I didn't have an internet connection, I would get the text message, and I would quickly go to a place where I could get Wi-Fi to uh, to respond. And sometimes, if I wouldn't, if I knew that I wasn't going to have internet for a while, I would ask a friend. To uh, to monitor my listing. So I, I'm picturing you now uh, getting into a wetsuit, about to go diving in, off the coast of Fiji, and then your phone rings and and you've got a text that somebody's got an inquiry. <laughs> Is this how yeah. you are managing renting out your place while traveling in you know ten time zones away? Yeah, exactly. And you know, there's not a benefit to uh, doing this because you know how. Um, when you're having dinner with people, it's not very polite to pull out your phone. So when you're, uh, so I always have an excuse to, uh, you know, pull out my phone and send somebody a message because I can just say, you know, I have to respond to my Airbnb guests. <laughs> <laughs> you know, say, oh, excuse me, I'm renting out my house on the other side of the world. Can you just give me a second? <laughs> exactly, yeah, and then you can just message. Uh, Somebody or, you know, but but uh, it's it's funny, but uh, it's probably happened more than once. In all seriousness, though, in, in addition to uh, to responding quickly, what are some of the other maybe uh, non-intuitive changes or small improvements that you made to start to really optimize your listing and have it be you know on the first page for all of Amsterdam? Well, um, you know, for example. Uh, when you write your description, you know you sh you have to try and make it a little bit inviting, you know, a little bit catchy. For example, you know, I my listing used to just state that I have a balcony, and instead of just stating the f that fact, I changed it to something like, "After enjoying an awesome day in Amsterdam." Uh, my balcony provides you with the opportunity to uh, relax in the afternoon sun while enjoying a freshly made uh, cup of coffee from my espresso machine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds much better than just a balcony. Exactly. Like uh, you know, I think it's it's really important to um, sort of describe the experience that people can have in your place. Uh, as opposed to just uh, mentioning uh, that you have uh, two bedrooms, uh, an oven, a microwave, and a separate toilet, and uh, you know I'm I'm always uh, very uh, surprised that when I go through some other Airbnb listings, you know you sometimes just literally see a ten-line list of 
you know, of the of the amenities or something that that the house has, and just zero sort of descriptive uh, sentences that the, you know that give you an imagination of uh, what the experience uh, would be like uh, if you're staying at the place as a guest. And honestly, it makes me think that that's what a good hotel chain would do too, isn't it? You know, they're oh, yeah. going to describe the area, what's nearby, some of the attractions that you can visit, and so. Exactly. Yeah. And one uh, one uh, other thing that I would like to mention that's really important is the pictures. You know, a picture. Uh, uh, what's the expression? A picture tells more more than a thousand words. Yep. <laughs> So Airbnb has this great service where they will send a professional photographer to your place to uh, make some uh, take some awesome pictures, and uh, you know it's uh, it's really a shame that uh, a lot of hosts are not taking advantage of this opportunity and they just put some some pictures that they make with their iPhone online, and I think that's uh, you know that that will really cost you a lot of bookings because the pictures are are very important. I, I wasn't even aware that uh, it sounds like Airbnb as a company is really working with you to help support you as a host to have the best listing and have the best presentation possible with, with services like that. Is there anything else that they do for, uh, for hosts, such as insurance or guarding against uh, theft or anything that could go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, one of the biggest concerns that people have when renting out their apartment to strangers is uh, that they worry that uh, their apartment is getting destroyed or, you know, people will break things or steal things. So Airbnb actually has a, uh, a very good program in place where they cover you up to a million dollars against damages uh, done to your house. Plus, you can also uh, you can also have your guests pay you a security deposit in case uh, any uh, damage is, is being done. You can then have Airbnb uh, refund you with the security deposit. So, and you know, there's other ways as well to to uh, to prevent these things from happening because you don't have to accept an inquiry. You know, you have the right. To accept or decline uh, a reservation based on the uh, the image that you have uh, of your potential guests, and um, so if you don't feel comfortable with uh, <clears throat> allowing a certain uh, certain people to stay at your house, you don't have to accept it. And Airbnb does not pen penalize you for that. You know, it does not hurt your rankings or reputation or whatsoever. So there's a uh, there's several ways to uh, to prevent uh, or minimize sort of the uh, the risk of damages happening in the first place, and you're protected uh, if if it does happen. But to be honest, I've hosted almost a hundred groups, and other than a couple of glasses, I don't think anything has been damaged at all. You know, people usually respect your property. Uh, the way you respect it yourself, I think. So if you make sure that the apartment is clean, is tidy, it looks nice, then people will treat it nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine that that the negative possibilities, they always get the headlines in the press, but it's good to hear that out of uh, 100 listings, you know, nothing more than a, a few broken glasses ever went wrong. So. If you were to sort of give a, an overview of like what's sort of three takeaways that, that people can do uh, and put into practice right away if they've already rented out their place or, or if they're thinking of putting their place on Airbnb to make a, an impact or increase the, their listing income, um, maybe you could share sort of your top three. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned before, I think uh, it starts with uh, with communicating well with the guests before they arrive. So create some nice email templates that you can send out. You know, using some some welcoming language like, you know, um, I would I always send my guests something like, um, hi. Let's say the guest name is John. 
Hi, John. Thank you very much for your booking. I'm really excited to uh, to host you. Um, here's a uh, here's a guide with information about my apartment and my neighborhood. Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm very happy to help you with any needs you might have. And uh, then I also ask uh, about their arrival time. You know, ask the guest like, "Hey, I, when do you plan to arrive? Are you taking a plane? Like, could you send me your plane, uh, the the number of the flight, so I can, you know, I can check in case of delays. Just let them know that you're." You're thinking about these things, you know. Let them know that you're aware of the of that there's, you know, things can go wrong, and that you're you're anticipating on that, because that will really make the guest feel like he doesn't have to worry. He can just get on the plane, and he just knows someone is going to make sure that when he arrives, there's a open door and there's somebody to welcome you. You know, so that's the first takeaway. You know. Uh, just make sure that the guest feels comfortable before arriving. And um, the second thing, I've already touched a little bit on this as well, but once again, the, the feedback is extremely important. So if your guest doesn't give you any feedback, I really recommend that you send your guests a, like a goodbye email after the stay and uh, encourage your guest to uh, to give you some feedback. Um, so you can say something like, "Hey, I'm always looking to improve my guest experience. So if there was anything at all, even if it's a minor issue, if there's anything at all that you've you know found not to be 100% in order, or if there were any disturbances or whatsoever, please let me know. I would really appreciate it if you if you could tell me that because this." You know, this is a really important. Your feedback is really important for me to to provide future guests with an even better experience. And you know, once you word it like this, people uh, are typically uh, very uh, happy to provide you with some feedback. That's good. Yeah, and I'm putting these into the chat roll too. So we got we got takeaway number one. Uh, and and what would be another one or two that people could put into practice? Yeah, so um, uh, let's see. So we, we've mentioned the communication with the guest up front. We've mentioned uh, uh, the, the feedback. Um, another thing is, you know, you can do a lot of things, small adjustments to your house to make your house more guest-friendly. Because, you know, living in a house and staying in a house as a tourist for like a week or so is, uh, is really a, a different thing. So before you start receiving guests, you know, take a quick walk around your house and think about what would be useful for guests and what's not useful for guests. And remove the items that they don't need and add the items that they might need. To give you a few examples, you know, there's no need to leave all your clothes in the wardrobes because the guests obviously is not going to wear your clothes and if you leave them there then the guest won't have any space to to store his own clothes you know other examples are like you know personal documents uh, pictures and, and all sorts of other personal items can be best uh, stored or, or put away at least and then some items that are really important for travelers well, for the female travelers, the hair dryer is the uh, the classic example of uh, of something that you definitely have to get. Uh, I didn't have a, a hair dryer myself. I don't dry my hair very often, personally. But <laughs> you know, when I had my first female guest, I uh, I realized what an important appliance it is for female travelers. So you know, um, <clears throat> if even if you don't use it or find it useful, it's really important to put yourself in the position of a traveler and just imagine that you just arrived after a 12-hour flight from, you know, the different parts in the world, like what would you appreciate when you walk into the house, you know? Maybe some, maybe a fresh towel with a, a little a fresh mint on top or some, you know, some small shampoo or, or uh, you know, toiletries and 
a, you know, a fresh cup of coffee. You know, these are just little things that you can do for your guests, which just uh, you know improves their experience a lot. A fun to set your place up to to receive uh, people, and you know, I'd be thrilled to arrive and have that. It's even better than the personal touch you get at a hotel. Absolutely, yeah. For helpful tips, thanks for that. And uh, and I know that I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about the book that you've written after traveling to 50 plus countries, getting your Airbnb uh, listing on the first page for all of Amsterdam, which I imagine has hundreds if not thousands of other properties, and you put together a book, didn't you, on how other people can, uh, as the name suggests, get paid for their pad. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, you know, after I figured out how to uh, how to manage my Airbnb listing in a uh, in a successful way, I noticed how many hosts were missing out on so many points because you know I, I use Airbnb as a traveler myself. So you know, I, I've seen uh, I've, I've I've been at quite a few places, and I just uh, I love optimization you know I, I, I studied uh, operations research back at university which is basically uh, all about optimization you know so I'm, I'm really I always think about how can you find an optimal way to do things and uh, once I figured it out I just I just had an urge to write it down and, and give it to other people because I, I, I could just see you know how much people were missing out. You know, and it's it's a shame because you know what it's one thing to make more money on your listing, but the reason why you're making that extra money is because you're improving the guest experience. So it's really a win-win situation for the host and the guest, and for Airbnb as well. You know, because when hosts are doing a better job, there will be more bookings, and Airbnb will benefit as well. So it's it's just a a really win-win-win situation in my mind. It, maybe the fourth win would be if more people uh, put into practice the things that you've figured out and that you've done with your place, then you have more uh, more exciting options of places to stay on your own travels. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> so where can, where can people find out about your book? I know it's uh, not coming out just yet, and I know that we've been working behind the scenes uh, on it, but uh, where can people find out more about Get Paid for Your Pad and be notified when it's ready? Yeah, so I, uh, I put up a website. It's called getpaidforyourpad.com. And um, you can fill in your email address there, and I will send you some updates about when the book is going to be launched. And also, especially for uh, people that are listening right now, I've created a special page. It's getpaidforyourpad.com slash summit. And uh, I don't know, maybe Jesse, you can uh, pull it up somehow. But uh, it's in the chat thread for everybody right now. OK, great. So what I did is I took the first two chapters of the book. And uh, if you fill in your email address on this page, I will send it to you, and you can have a look at it. It, it contains uh, the introduction to the book, uh, and, and that will be most inter interesting for people who aren't currently hosting on the Airbnb, but are maybe thinking about doing it in the future, or people who are just not aware of the potential gold mine that they might be sitting on, as well as uh, the, the first chapter, which uh, describes how to prepare your house to start receiving guests. I just uh, I just put that into the chat thread there so that everybody can click through and access it. And we'll make sure to update the page as well with a link so you can get the introduction and first couple chapters of Get Paid for Your Pad and then be uh, alerted on when the whole book is ready to come out. And when when do uh, when can people expect the book to be released, Jasper? That's a good question. You know, as a fellow uh, author, you know that uh, uh, writing the book 
uh, is uh, probably 20% of the time, and then making adjustments and moving uh, content around and improving the layout and all, all that kind of stuff uh, takes uh, probably more than 80% of the time. So, I mean, I'm aiming to, uh, to release it uh, in the first or the second week of April. Perfect. And uh, just was taking a look at that page even now. It's looking good. I know that the uh, there'll be a new cover and a bunch of extra bonus content as well that's in there. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, as we're getting close to the end here, it's been a fascinating discussion, and uh, I think you had a lot of useful tips to say as well as something you know very inspirational about how you've used. Airbnb in your apartment to really fund uh, just an endless round of global adventures. I think uh, that's a lifestyle that many people aspire to and you've really achieved it. So I want to acknowledge you for that and think that it's awesome what you're doing and uh, and super excited to to be involved with uh, your book and, and see how everything's progressing on that front. So is there any uh, any final words or any thoughts that you'd like to share before we wrap up here on Lifestyle Entrepreneur Summit Saturday edition? Well, you know, I um, I wanted to share maybe a few a few lessons that I've learned over the last few years when it comes to uh, to online businesses because uh, you know I, I imagine there might be some people uh, listening right now. Who might want to start a uh, a business in the future, and uh, so I I wrote down a, a couple a couple things that uh that I've learned over the last few I'd years. I'd love to hear that. Let's please do share those. Okay, so you know, let's just start with the with the most important thing that that I've learned. You know, I always thought that. To, to run a successful business you you need to have you need to either be extremely talented or have like an awesome idea you know something that nobody else does but what I've realized and this is not for my not just for my own experience but also from all the lifestyle entrepreneurs that I've met over the years I started noticing that it's not talent that makes you successful. I mean, it can be, but it's definitely not necessary to have an extreme talent in it for something. What I think is the most, you know, it's uh, the, the, the reason why I think being passionate is, is the most important thing is because, you know, it's doing, starting a business is not a one-way street to success, you know. There's going to be ups and downs all along the way and there's going to be moments where you know you you're you might be really close to giving up and um, I think if you if you really have a passion for what you're doing that will really help you through those difficult moments that you uh, that you uh, are going to experience and um, you know if you if you just put in the effort and are willing to step outside of your comfort zone to to make it happen then I'm confident that pretty much anyone on on this planet can can uh, can start a successful business. And um, the other thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, don't expect or uh, your first business to immediately be a huge success. You know, most people that are successful with business have failed many, many, many times. And this has also been a huge realization for myself because I remember, I remember the first few things that I tried, and when it didn't work out, you know, I was getting a little worried. I was like, "Fuck, maybe I, maybe this is not for me, or maybe you know, I, I'm not, not good at this." And once I realized that, you know, even some of the most successful people in the world have, you know, have started out failing many, many times. I don't know if you can uh, relate to this, uh, Jesse. What you're saying is is so 100% right on, and I think people need to hear that, like failure isn't the end of the world. In fact, just like negative feedback, it's a learning experience, and if you can embrace both of those, then your overall results 
in business and in life just go through the roof. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, I remember when um, when I was thinking about starting something, I had the I kind of wanted to know all the problems that I might be facing in the future and f solve all those problems before I would even start with, with the business. And uh, what, I've, what I've noticed is that if you do that, then you're going to find so many potential barriers and potential problems and think, things that could potentially go wrong that you're, you're just going to get so demotivated that you know the business is, is probably never going to happen. So I really want to advise listeners uh, to the show: if you have an idea and you wanna you wanna start your your business, start it sooner than later. You know, because the the you're definitely going to run into a lot of barriers, but you can deal with those along the way. And it's really hard to predict like what sort of barriers are going to show up. So you know, the most important thing is to take action and get things going. And even if even if your first project uh, won't be successful, you are going to learn so much from from over trying to overcome those barriers that your second go is going to even have a, a much bigger chance. So um, you know, don't wait around. Take action and just go for it. And your third, and your fourth, and your tenth, and your fifteenth. Exactly. Yeah. As long as you keep doing that, yeah. you start to get really such, a, such an edge. What's really interesting, Jesse, and I, I, I'm very curious to know if, if you would agree with with me on this one. You know, I first I always thought that you learn from making mistakes in the way that if you make a few mistakes, you then magically sort of come up. With with the right way to do things, you know, almost like a you make a couple mistake and you go back to your desk and you solve some formula, and and suddenly you uh, you discover the right way to do it. But what I have experienced is that it's more the other way around. It's you're just making so many mistakes that at some point, you know, there's no mistakes left, and sort of the only way, the only way, the only thing to do that's left that you haven't done yet is the right way, so you kind of stumble upon it, you know, by... But then you know it's the right way. It went to, it's, exactly, yeah. it's interesting what you're saying is like somebody um, saw this one infographic or whatever, it's like the route to success is not like this, right? Not just a straight line. It's like you try this over here, it doesn't work, you ping, you zigzag, and then you slowly triangulate until you figure out the lay of the land and how to actually be effective uh, in your industry. Exactly. Yeah. That's the real learning experience. You know, you can read a, a thousand books on business strategy and what successful business people have done, but all that is uh, looking backwards. Whereas, anytime you do a new business venture, anytime you have a new idea, there's going to be something specific to the time that you're doing it and the the state of the industry. So you can only really learn what that is by going through it. So, I, I definitely agree with uh, your recommendations and your advice there. It's been my experience too. Yeah, and it's interesting that you notice reading books about business because because the other the other interesting thing is that the mistakes that you make, you know, are actually looking back, they're 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 things that you already know almost, you know. Like to give you an example, everybody knows that it's important to have a competitive advantage when you're doing when you're having a business, right? They call it a USP, a unique selling point. In, I mean, if you go on the street and you ask ten people, "Hey, do you think it's important to have a competitive advantage in a business?" I'm pretty sure that everyone's going to say yes. But the thing is, being aware of a concept and actually fully understanding it and knowing it is are two different things. You know, I've always known that it's important to have a, uh, a competitive advantage, but even though I knew it, I still I've still started businesses that clearly didn't have one, you know. And it's only when you start something and you know you're you're just wondering like why doesn't this work? Why don't people want to buy my product? Or you know why don't I get any clients? 
you know, that's when you really feel the, you know, sort of the uh, the pain that 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 uh, that you have when when you don't have that competitive advantage, and that's when you re when it really hardwires into your brain, and it prevents you from from starting a, a new business that also doesn't where you also doesn't have the you know where you also don't have the competitive advantage. And and there's so many other examples of concepts and theories. Like uh, even supply and demand is such things that you learn in school that conceptually they just make sense. When you yeah. actually experience what it's like to have a huge demand but you can't meet it, that you don't have enough products or you don't have the inventory or whatever it is, and you're like, wow, you know, then it all of a sudden becomes real how that pull between uh, such simple concepts or economic forces play out. And to me, that's exciting. Uh, I love learning that learning in that way in real time. And it's part of the theme of doing like, you know, this whole summit. It's all real time. We've got people here talking. Uh, Navid says hi. Daniel from Sweden says what's up. Scott says it's good to hear how you guys view failure. So there's a really uh, a real time dialogue going on now around the world. And this is even something that there's no textbooks about it because it's a development in the last six months or a year that you can even do stuff like this with technology. Yeah. So. Exploring it is like being yeah. on the forefront of, of innovation. I like that aspect too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's just amazing what's possible these days. You know, and within a few minutes you can set up these these webinars and, and Google Hangouts and just communicate with people from all over the world and everyone can watch, you know, it's like having your own TV show really. Um, and uh, and podcast and blog and newspaper. It's like all publishing is available now at the at the tip of your fingers. I know you've experienced that with um, the Traveling Dutchman blog, and uh, and you will through the book on how that can reach people from all around the world that you don't even know. And then it's interesting how it comes back to you. And I'll get letters, you know, every week from someone. It's like you know I read your book six months ago and. It inspired me to do X, Y, and Z, and now I'm doing this, and I just wanted to say thanks. And just like for that person you said that complains, you know, for every person that takes the time to write, there's probably 10, 20, 100 more silent ones that you know you're making an impact and you're reaching people, even if it doesn't uh, echo back to you. But those are some of the most rewarding experiences of seeing the other side of having created something or written something and put it out there on how other people interact with it and experience it in the world. Absolutely. Any final words of wisdom or takeaways from your travels, your business experience? Um, would would love to yield the floor and hear what those are, and then yeah, we'll I mean, start uh, to come to a come to a close. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, you know, thank you again for uh, having me in the show. I, I really uh, enjoyed uh, this chat. And um, yeah, once again, like you know, to to people who are watching this, you know, just uh, just really realize that you know it's uh, everyone can really be successful, and and uh, you know you can start your own online business. You don't need a lot of money. You know, these days you, for a few hundred bucks, you can you can put up a website. You know, so you know I really want to emphasize. You know, just take action, follow follow your passion, do what you're passionate about, and uh, and get going. And don't be afraid. You know, there's and uh, there's a uh, they say that all progress happens outside of the comfort zone, uh, which I think is uh, is is definitely true. So uh, and I think Navid, who you just mentioned, is is going to be uh, on on the show on uh, on on Tuesday, is it or Wednesday? Yep, he's coming up. I think he's a great example of someone who uh, really pushes himself to be out of the comfort zone, you know, and I, I really uh, respect that. So I, I can recommend everybody uh, watch, to watch his show as well because uh, it's pretty amazing what he's done in a short amount of time, I think. For sure. I'm looking forward to, to showcasing him here on the summit soon and uh, 
you can pop in on the chat thread and, and drop a link. He says, yeah. <laughs> Maybe you go ahead and drop your, uh, your, your URL in there too so people can find out about you since uh, Jasper's giving you props here uh, on this live broadcast. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if I can mention just one more thing. Uh, so I talked about uh, how I was in Brazil and I visited these coffee farms and stuff. So I've recently started a new trading firm which is called uh, rxptrading.com. And uh, the reason why I wanted to mention it is because we have a referral program in place where we're paying out 15% of any, to people who bring us in, in touch with any people involved in trading. Um, so, you know, if you, if you know anyone who's involved in, especially in, in, uh, in Brazil with commodities like coffee and, and, uh, and rice and corn, or if you know somebody who's interested in, uh, in sourcing some products from, uh, from China, then uh, feel free to shoot me a message, and if, if anything materializes, uh, you will be rewarded uh, by 50% uh, of, uh, of the future profits. Stuff. I just put that in on the chat thread uh, in real time there. So got a link and what you guys are looking for. So everybody can, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure to update the page with that as well. So people can uh, see and check out some of the other things you're involved in, in addition to having your place on Airbnb. Um, Jasper, this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm so happy to have you on the summit and, uh, and to have you in Lifestyle Entrepreneur and to have you as a friend. So here's to uh, more adventures to come. And thanks so much for taking the time to join us here. Any, uh, any final words? And then we'll wrap this baby up. Yeah, then, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you uh, so much for having me on. And I'm looking forward to uh, watching the other uh, entrepreneurs that are coming up in the next few days. You got it. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll have the replay live in just a few seconds here. And when you refresh the page, we'll update with all the information Jasper shared. Make sure to grab the first couple chapters of Get Paid for Your Pad. And, uh, and that's at getpaidforyourpad.com slash summit to download those right away. And we'll see you on the next broadcast. Thanks, Jasper. Take care, everybody, and talk to you soon. Ciao.